All right, second lecture, we're gonna talk about power series and analytic functions. And before that, I should assume that you know some properties of infinite series. So first is absolute convergence implies convergence. So we first we prove the partial sum is a Cauchy sequence and we prove it by using the fact that we have a triangle inequality and this sum is monotonically increasing. So, and we use the fact that this is convergent. So the proof is trivial, okay? And definition, we give a definition of lower limit, arm limit, or limb soup, limb in. Limit superior or limit inferior. So recall when we're doing a Walter Rudin's lecture, right? We define the upper limit as, this is a long time ago, but I think we define it as the supremum of set of all subsequent limits, right? About it doesn't matter of their definitions, but what it matters is what the properties they have, okay? So here we give our new definition. So limit, upper limit is to be defined as the, inf so each supremum, right? So each a n, for every n greater than k, we take their supremum, and we take the infimum among all k non-negative. Well, notice that the supremum is monotone, right because if you have this set and you have a, another big set the supremum of this set and the supremum of this set notice that the supremum of the bigger set is an upper bound of every set in the smaller set which means that the supremum of the bigger set should be what greater than or equal to the supremum of the smaller set so supremum is like monotonically is monotone right as you if the set increases you increase if the set decrease you decrease now when when we're asking n greater than k as k increases right the supremum is decreasing right well it turns out that if the sequence is bounded then we have what the monotone convergence theorem, right? Then this is this is like well defined. If otherwise, it might be negative infinity, right? But it doesn't matter. But if it's bounded, right? We just define it to be this. They're equal to each other. Okay, they're equal. All right. So here we have some useful definition and the proofs. So if a is greater than the limit superior, then there exists an n naught such that for any m, we have x m is strictly less than a. If a is less than the limit superior, then we have exist infinitely many m that have infinitely many m such that it's strictly greater than a. And a similar result holds for the for the lower limit. Okay? So first, let's prove this statement first. So to prove this statement is like because a is greater than the upper limit, right? If you're greater than the greatest lower bound, then you're not a lower bound, which means that there exists an n naught such that such that this n naught such that this term is strictly less than a and is bounded by the limit inferior. Okay, so we have this. Well, analyzing this means that a is an upper bound of x m for all m greater than naught. Right? The, the the meaning. Okay, so we're done. Okay, now if a is less than the upper limit, then it exists infinitely many m such that xm is greater than a. We just follow our definition. A is less than the infima, which means that a is a lower bound because a is less than the greatest lower bound. Right? If you're less than the greatest lower bound, you're still a lower bound. Then it means that for any n, we have this is true. For each n, we have a is less than the supremum of this for n, which means that for each given n, we can pick an element from this set such that xm is greater than a, right? Because it's less than the supremum. Then we have infinitely many xm that is less than a. 
okay? And we define the power series about A to be something like this. Okay, Z minus A naught. So this is the power series, sticking as a limit of partial sums. Well, like the useful one is the geometric series, and I think you suppose know that if, if you have this, then it converges to this one. Otherwise, it diverges, okay? And here comes theorem 1.3. We should start proving stuff. Okay, so 1.3 says that for a given power series, we define a number r by this. Okay, it's the upper limit of this sequence. Each an is the coefficients. So each an, we take the absolute value and then we take their nth root corresponding with their index. Okay, so we have this sequence and we take their upper limit to be defined as 1 over r. Now, if the distance between z and a is less than this r, then the series converges absolutely, which means that this sequence, this series, converges, okay? If it's greater, then the series diverges because the term becomes unbounded. Now, because the necessary condition of a series being converged is that the terms converges to zero, right? If you, if the series becomes unbounded, the terms becomes unbounded, then the series, of course, must be diverging. We use contrapositive, right? Now, if for pick an r that is between zero and r, then the sequence, then the series converges uniformly whenever z minus a is less than or equal to r, their distance. It's the uniform convergent. So for this, we're going to use the y stress m test, right? And the number r is unique because we define it like this. And the property is a and b. Well, the uniqueness will be proven in next next proposition. Okay, the uniqueness is given by a limit. And then we know that the limit is unique. Okay, it's a limit of some sequence. So the limit is unique, then R is unique. Okay, I would just like, um, uh, spoiler alert, sorry, it's unique. Okay, so theorem 1.3. Let's just, um, okay, look at this. Theorem 1.3. We shall prove it. Okay. So throughout the proof, we're gonna assume that a is a is equal to zero. So we simplify the question. We simplify our problem. And you will see that we can just substitute a with any random thing and the proof remains unchanged. Okay, so for simplicity, we suppose that a is equal to zero and that is less than r. And here we're gonna use, we're gonna play around with the inequalities. It's kind of tricky. So we pick r such that z is between r and the big r. What this means we have that one over r is greater than one over r, right? Here we have this. And one of r is our definition right here. Okay, then which means that 1 over r is squared than upper limit of a n, 1 over n, is squared than this upper limit. Well, we call from our lem proposition, right? If it's greater than the limit, then we have exists n such that. And we have what is strictly less than r, right? Yeah, strictly less than r. Well, so we have what we have is that we have a n is less than one over r to the n. 
right? We just multiply, we just take nth power on both sides, and we multiply Zn back in. It's going to be less than Zrn, right? All right. Now, what it means is that the tail, the tail, the tail, right, the tail of this limit is less than, is dominated by, by this series, right? Yes, but we have z over r is less than 1, right? We have z over r is less than 1, again, right? But it doesn't matter because they're all positive, which means that, which means that this, sequ this series converges. Right? And we know that convergence series are bounded and u are increasing. So you by monotone bounded theorem, right, we have also this. Converges. So it converges absolutely when z is in R. Okay, so we have done, we have done part A. Okay, we have done part A. Converges absolutely. Okay, now we're trying to do part C first. We're trying to prove the uniform convergence. We're trying to prove when Z is these. This is series converges uniformly on this set. Okay, all right. Now, because if we have r is less than r, right? If we have r is less than r, again, we can pick, do the same trick, pick row such that row lies between the small r and the big r. And then we can pick big n such that we have a n is less than 1 over rho n, right? Why can we do this? Because if we take this as greater than 1 over r, right? Such that it's strictly less than this for any, right, for any of this. Okay. Now, if we have z is less than or equal to r, well, what this means is that a and z to the n less than or equal to what? So we're assuming n is greater than or equal to this capital N. Then z is less than or equal to r, and a n is less than or equal to rho n. That means that if we multiply, right, we multiply both sides, we have r over rho. And, and, and we have r, r over rho is less than 1, right? Which means that r over rho and converges. Now, m test gives uniform convergence. Okay, because notice our function, right? Our function this is all bounded, and this series converges, which means that this series converges uniformly, right? Now we have done A and C, let's do B. 
for a bee. What B says is that, oh, if you're outside the radius of convergence, right? If you're outside the radius, then the terms of the series becomes unbounded, so it diverges. So we're assuming A is equal to zero, so we just assume that Z is greater than R. We pick Z greater R, greater R, which means that one of R is less than one of R. Well, again, by this, by our lemma, or by our proposition, we have infinite, infinitely many n such that 1 over r is less than this. And we know that a and z, this is the thing we want to compute, is greater than z over r. And notice this, we have we have the series is unbounded, right? Because we have we have infinitely many terms such that this is greater than this. And no matter what, for all the infinitely many terms, this is always increasing. So, like. It's partial series, you know what I'm saying? Like, it is always diverges. So, the terms gets unbounded, right? It gets unbounded, so it diverges. Okay, so we have proven A, B, and C, and we conclude our proof is done. Right. So, wait, okay, that's too big. I don't like it. So we concluded our proof is done. Okay. All right, let's just move on to proposition 1.4. Remember, R is called a radius convergence of the power series, sorry. So here we have a formula for the radius of convergence. We got a power series of radius convergence, then we have a formula. If this limit exists, if this limit exists, we have this, okay? Now, what is it? It's 1.4, right? Proposition 1.4. Well, for this one, we first assume that assume that a is equal to zero. Okay, let alpha equals to the limit of a n, a n plus one, taking absolute value. Okay, this is we define alpha. And we want to show that first, we want to show that alpha is less than equal to r. We want to show this. So you show this, suppose that, suppose that z is less than r is less than alpha. So we just make, make some random assumption. Okay, some random assumption. Well, well, you will see the the what's it called? The purpose of this assumption. Okay, and find n such that for any n greater equal to n of r is less than this is doable because we assume this series. The limit, the limit exists, right? Now we let b to be equal to a n r n, the corresponding capital N. So what we know is that then what we know is that okay, n plus one plus one are in this less than a n are in 
right? Because we have this inequality. And we can keep going. Right? Once again, less than. Still less than B. So we can prove by induction, right? Then by induction, we know that A N R N is going to be for any N greater equal to the capital N given. Okay? So this is what we want, what we have. Now, what we know is that, okay, let's just move to here. Then, we know that the terms of the series is equal to this times Zn Rn. Or we can remove the absolute value sign, but it doesn't matter. It's plus equal to b times z and r n for any n greater equal to capital n right and we know that since we have z less than r which means that this is just a constant this is just a constant and this we have this so obviously what we have is that This thing converges, right? Well, converges. Well, from here, from here, we can say that, from here, we can say that alpha is less than or equal to r. Why? Because if if alpha is greater than r, we can pick r. We can pick this. We can pick r between them. Then, when z is less than r, but it is right, it is greater than r. It's greater than radius convergence. We have in z and diverge. And converge. Converge is because z is greater than r, uh, less than r. And it diverges because you are greater than the radius of convergence. So you get a contradiction, which means that alpha is less than equal to r. Okay? Now we want to show that alpha is greater than equal to r. We want to show this. Well, we can do the similar trick, right? So if z is greater than r than alpha, then we know that there exists n such that for any n greater than n, we have r is greater than a n a n plus one. Right? Then we know that a n less than r times a and plus one right then as above above we above we have if r is less than this and here we have r is greater than this so we get we get a n r n greater or equal to b Right, because here we get all less than equal to b, and here we invert, we reverse it, then we should get greater than or equal to, right? To b, we get okay. This equals to then 
we know that a n z n is greater to b f z n r n. Okay. But notice that we're just using the tricks, right? Z, we have this. Then we have this. Well, which means that. goes in infinity right and we know that all these terms are greater than the, these terms well if this diverges then we also know that Zn diverges right so we have shown that if Z is greater than R greater than alpha we have this divergence. Now, we just, so here we, above we make this claim and we have this argument, right? And here is basically just by symmetry, right? By symmetry. We repeat, we repeat our argument, we will get alpha less than equal to r. Because here, no, I'm sorry. Alpha greater equal to. It's just by symmetry. And we are done, right? Okay. So we have proven our result is that if this limit exists, then r is equal to this alpha, right? Alpha r is equal to alpha. Okay. Now we move on to proper propositions. Well, here remember we define e to the z to be equal to this power series. This series, the radius convergence is infinity, right? We use proposition one point where the this radius convergence is infinity. So, so it's well defined for each complex number. We define e to the x, which is just an exponent function, to be defined with this power series, exponential series of function. And here are some. Um, properties of infinite series that so if cn is like the Cauchy product right and these two converges absolutely then this converges absolutely with the sum is the product of a n and b n and the proof is omitted and i will also omit it because we have we have outlined the exactly we we did this in the rudin's lecture so it's a, it's about power it's about series you have the exact same result and we've proven so it's kind of long so i just skip it now 1.6 says that we have a with these two b two power series notice that they're all about a right with radius convergence that is greater than some real r we put c in to be fine like the koji product then there's some and this is the product has radius of convergence also greater than r and we have this is equal to the sum and this is equal to the product for z minus a less than r so this is proposition 1.6 Proposition 1.6 is that if we have and for we're assuming a equal to zero, okay? For z less than s. Plus Bn, Zn. We have triangle inequality. We always use the triangle inequality. See how powerful is the triangle inequality, right? Because these two converges absolutely, and 
they're less than ours, radius of convergence, so this converges. And right. Which means that this series, right? This series converges. Okay. Converges. Okay, converge. Because this holds for all S, right? So the radius of convergence, the radius of convergence for this one is greater than or equal to R because it satisfies for all S less than R, right? So the radius convergence might be R or might be greater than R. It can't be less than R because you can think about it, okay? And a CN, the CN is just the repetition. It's kind of similar, so I just skip it. And this formula, because we just use the, these, this formula and this formula is really just application of 1.5 and the properties of limit of sequences, right? Okay, so. All right. So here we're gonna move on to analytic functions. So this discussion is worth, we discuss, is worth, worth like talking about this. And this section is on the function. Okay, you should know that the Cauchy Riemann equations. If you don't know it, it's okay. It's not that hard. It's not that deep. 2.1, right? We have a definition is that if G is open set in C and F maps from a complex number to a complex number. So we're taking complex numbers and your output is also complex number. Then, well, we can say that F is just some, some subset of R squared, right? F is some R squared to R squared, right? But remember in multivariable calculus, right? In multivariable calculus, in multivariable calc for f mass from rm to rn, right? The derivative of f is a linear map. Such that what? Such that h approaches to a zero vector, and f of u plus h minus f of u minus df. Okay, let me just. Is a linear map b b times h divided by the norm of h right <laughs> this is our definition of multivariable calculus the derivative okay well for here we define it as a quotient well why f can be viewed as a rm to rm because it's a complex number to complex numbers basically r2 to r2 why don't we just define it like this? Well, if you remember that when we are defining the derivative of this, we mentioned that we cannot define we cannot define division in anything that's Rn where n is greater than one. No division exists. But in complex plane, we have defined division as a field. So that's like the that's the very big difference. It's a very big difference. See, we can divide complex numbers. But in real numbers, we cannot define our elements in R2 or elements in R4 or elements in R17, right? We cannot define division, but here we have division. And then this makes the definition of derivative seems really like 
the derivative and real value functions, right? So, the value of this limit is denoted by f prime a. It's called the derivative of f at a. If the derivative is continuous, we said it's continuously differentiable. And if it's infinitely, each successive derivative is again differentiable, it's called infinitely differentiable. Or, recall from multiple calculus, I'll just call it like a smooth function, okay? C infinity, okay? A smooth function. So, here is a proposition. Differentiable implies continuity, okay? Proposition 22. So that this makes sure that this this definition of derivatives kind of makes sense. Kind of it's kind of good. Okay. Now, a f z minus f a. Well, this is basically we just do. this and each of their limit exists this limit exists because if it's differentiable and this is equal to zero so it goes zero okay one line proof okay a function is analytic if it's continuously differentiable on on the set g okay so the derivative is continuous and we know that in calculus, the sum of products are analytic, f and g are analytic, and the loss for differentiating sums, products, and quotients remains valid because we're defining this in the same form, right? And the, and the proof of the real derivatives, like, we could just substitute it with complex variables without making any effect. So the so the proofs of all the the product rule, the quotient rule, if if f and g analytic, f plus g is analytic, like it all remains valid. Okay, and something that's worth to talk about is the chain rule. Okay, so the chain rule. All right, so the chain rule. By four. So let's talk about chain rule. We fix fix Z naught and G and because G is open we can find a ball that lies in G. We want to show that if then This limit equals to g prime of. So here we are using sequential characterization of limits. If you can observe, right? This is basically the sequential characterization. Okay, do some thinking. It is not that deep. Okay, if we can show this, then we have proved the theorem. So, case one. If f of z not, does not equal to f of plus h for all n, h n for all n, then we can divide what f 
of z0 plus hn minus f of z0. We can divide them because they're not equal to each other. <laughs> right? So then we know that g of f is doing computations. Right? hn. smaller okay multiply by right this HN okay now the proof is here is really basically completed right because As we know that <laughs> right? Because this goes to zero. This thing goes to zero. Right? thing goes to zero right then we know that this is basically a derivative and g is differentiable and this is also a derivative because hn goes to zero right so these two are derivatives and there's this product of derivatives so we can so we're done right because this is basically g prime at f of z naught and multiply this which is when we take a one bit which is f prime as z naught and we're done okay case two different cases is that when when we have oh my god When we have this equal to this for infinitely many n, when we have this, then we can break the sequence. We can break the sequence hn. We can break 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 this into two sequences, kn and ln right such that what we have we have all all the kns when they disagree with each other and all the lns that when they agree with each other right <laughs> because f is differentiable because f is differentiable then we know that this derivative, right, is really just limit of we using sequential characterizations again. Okay. The derivative is equal to zero, right? Because this is a subsequence of Hn. Hn goes to zero, then this goes to zero. So we have this, and they all just agree with each other, so this term vanishes. <laughs> and we know that by case one, we know when they disagree with each other, then GOF. just right so
so we have this equals zero. So they equal each other. <laughs> so just put the H back. So we're doing case work and the third case the third case is that when when this <laughs> or finally may well this is left as an exercise we can just use case two Break, break them apart, right? <laughs> then we're done. <sighs> All right, we have verified the chain rule. It's a long process, but it's fine, okay? And here are some notes uh, from author that I think I should read it out. And like many people might ask this, is this theory to be a simple generalization of calculus? Is no. Like I already told you guys, right? Nah, because we're dividing complex numbers. So many things could happen. So we will show that differentiable function is analytic. If you're differentiable, then your derivative is automatically continuous. And this is a remarkable result, because for this function, real function, it is not continuously differentiable. This is an exercise from real analysis that I'll skip for now, okay? Another equality, uh, another equally remarkable result is that differentiable is analytic, and analytic function is infinitely differentiable, okay? And it has a power series expansion about each point on its domain. This is like a really, really, really strong result. Right? But we're just assuming it's differentiable. Like, if you're differentiable, you're analytic. Yeah, and you have a infinitely differentiable. You have a power series expansion and about each point on its domain. This is so strong. As a humble hypothesis gives such far-reaching results. Right? We're going to investigate this. Oh, uh, I mean later. <laughs> so, here's the proposition. So, we proved that power series are now analytic. So we let f z could be a a power series with radius and convergence r greater than zero. For each k, the series this series has radius of convergence of r. So this series has the same convergence, radius convergence as this given series. And the function f is infinitely differentiable on the ball around a. Okay, so in a proof, we would say let's just, just let a equal to zero to simplify. Okay, there's not a big difference. This is, we have, we've changed nothing. Furthermore, this is basically just a derivative. So this is like just like the 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 power rule, right? You drop it, you drop it, you drop it k times. But here we're doing with limits, and the surprising result is that it is still legal to do this, right? <laughs> and each a n is defined to be like this. For n greater zero, we have a formula for a n. All right, so let's just prove a first. Let's just prove this there first, okay? So this one, um. Let me just let me just write it here. Okay. So proposition two point five.
Okay. Mm. Proof. Assume zero. <laughs> so let's proof A first. Well, here's a remark. If the result true for k equals a one, then true for true for k equals to two, three, blah blah blah. Why? Because as we know, k equals when the k equals to two is just applying k equals to 1 to the series okay so this is also a power series and we say that this is for any power series, so this is also a power series. And we know that if we have a power series, then k equals to 1, we have a result. For this, and we say k equals 1, well, this becomes is just k equals to 2 for this given power series. Okay? You can just do the check, alright? But it's like time consuming, so I just skip it. Well, you have to check it, because I checked it. Okay, I just I just skipped it, but I actually did check. I actually did the verification on my own. Okay, so I recommend you also do the verification. It's just shifting index. Okay, it's just shifting index. Okay. Oh, sorry, sorry. I <laughs> okay. So here, uh, so here's like the it suffices to prove that is true for k equals one. Okay. Now to prove A. We want to show that this 1 over R is equal to N A N. Yes. So why we want to show this? Because as a proposition we define above right we say that this is the radius of convergence for this series now we considering this series right then this n a n right one over n minus one which means that they have the same radius of convergence we don't want to show this is true and here i have a lemma i have to state a lemma here is that for a and b and positive sequence and the sequence bn converges the sequence bn converges and the limit is positive and we let a to be the upper limit of an okay then we have the upper limit product is equal to a times b <laughs> okay so here's the lemma i just assume it's true first I will give a proof after the proof of the theorem. Okay, after proof of the theorem. Okay, now we have this result. Assume this is true. We want to show this is true. Now, since we know that the limit of ln n over n minus 1 is equal to 0, we use L'Hopital. With L'Hopital, then we know that by some elementary evaluation of limits, n, 1 over 1 minus n, is equal to 1. We just evaluate this limit. And using lemma, if we know, if we can show that, if we can show that, um, upper limit of a n minus 1 is equal to r n 
minus one. So if we can show if we can show this is true, if we can show this is true. Then we use the lemma. Okay, we use the lemma. We say that this is true. It's easy to see that, right? Because Okay, limit superior of a and b n. So limit superior of this times this, which is the limit superior of this is equal to a b. So this series converges, right? So which is the limit superior of this this one. So a is like this one, r minus one times the limit of. So it just itself. So this is what we want to show, right? This is what we want to show. This is what we want, man. Okay. So we want to show that, so the thing we want is just to show this. We're breaking our problem into easier and easier stuff, right? But this turns out to be not that, not that simple, okay? It's not that simple. So we want to show this. Okay, so um, to start, we first we just define r prime. We just let our r prime power node 1 to be of a n okay so our prime negative 1 to be this okay then is the radius of convergence radius of convergence of of this series okay well this is really just right this is really just this but we notice that Z times a n plus 1 z n plus a naught is equal to a n z to the n right some simple evaluation right so when we know that z is less than r prime we have this is really just here we're just doing this, right? We just put absolute value on both sides. A nod Z times absolute value of this. But when Z is less than R prime. And r prime to negative one is really the rate of radius of convergence of this series. Oh my god, what am I doing here? Right? Right? So which means that we have the convergence. Because when this, this is just a constant, and this converges, this is also a constant, so this whole thing, which means that this thing converges. Well, for this, we know that r prime of less than or equal to r. Right? Because when you're less than this, this converges absolutely. So, this should be less than or equal to r. Cannot be, it cannot be greater than r because if it's greater than r, we can find some, we can find some z, right? 
such that when this, we have this converges, right? This gives converges and this gives divergence. We get a contradiction. So we should have this, okay? And to, so now we want to show this direction, right? We want to show this direction. Then, now, if z is less than r, and z is not equal to zero, we first, we already know that this converge is absolutely right. And we know that, and we also have that this series is equal to times this minus less infinity, right? Because, well, if z is equal to zero, then every, every sum is zero, it just converges. So we don't, we, we don't think about that case, it's a trivial case. Then we have this, well, this is just this formula, okay? Just rearranging. And this converges, well, this means that r is less equal to r prime because r prime is the radius of convergence for this series, and, right? Well, this means that r equal to r prime. So we have done part A. We have done part A. Let me just do part B and part C here. Let me just do part B here, okay? Let's save some space. And part B is that, let's look at part B first. The function is infinitely differentiable on this radius. And furthermore, it's given by the series. So this, this the kth derivative is just equal to this, of this function. Wow. So we know that for z less than r we put we're giving definitions so we give g of z to be equal to yes sn is just a partial sum is the tail okay we're giving definitions now we fix the w we fix the w in some the radius of convergence right okay we fix the w and we fix R such that yes, we fix R such that this is true. Then we want to show that we want to show that f prime w is equal to g of w. Right? This is g of w. We want to show that this is true. If we showed this is true, which means that given any given any power series with radius of convergence r right for w and this radius convergence we have is differentiable and we have this formula now if you want to continue we let this to be our f and here okay then because we know that like we have changed this this is just something in form of this, and this has a radius of convergence r too. Also has a radius of convergence r. So we can really just make this to this f, right? And we just make our new g is some n n minus n plus one. I forgot, I forgot some new thing, and we can argue this again with for if this g is this our f, right? And this g is something new. If we show this, then we are done.
right? So basically, just saying that let, let g equals to f prime. Then our new g is so like a g, say g two, right? Then we have then we have g equals f prime, which means g prime, f prime prime is some g two, and g two is basically some new new thing that looks like, so you know, you know what I'm saying. But you guys should be smart enough, right? You guys, I think you guys are all smarter than me. So I'm just making stupid arguments. Okay, we pick a delta such that the closed ball lies in the, this ball. We let z to be this this ball, okay? Now we calculate this quotient, this difference. This is really just, I'm just write it out first. Okay, I'm just write it out first. Just give me more space. Okay, okay. And then we group them as a field. We have associated law. <laughs> Remember, we are in a field complex field, associative law. Now, so we just calculate each of them. We calculate this, we calculate this, we calculate this. What we want is to we squeeze all of them. We squeeze all of them so that we can say that this goes to zero, right? This goes to zero and we're done. So let's just squeeze this first. Now, let me just copy this thing. Right? This is our definition. And it's basically equal to where we can pull this constant inside. Remember this thing. This thing, what is this thing equal to? This thing is equal to, right? Plus it's less than equal to, we use triangle inequality, and then we also use the fact that. We're in this ball, okay? We're in this ball. And Z is in the ball, so that both of our magnitude of Z and our magnitude of Z and magnitude of W, right, should be all less than R, okay? We're in this ball. So, triangle inequality gives this. So, we can say that we can say that, oh my god, this thing, we 
where k goes from n plus 1 to infinity, right? Okay, good. Yes, great. This is legal. And now we know that as r is less than the big R, we define this, right? Then we can say that we know by proposition 1.4, right? And we know that we have a n times n. They're all equal, right? Because the limit of this quotient is equal to one. So, which means that they have the same radius of convergence. Right. Here's our a, here's our coefficient, right? And r is less than this. And this is equal to r. And this r is like can view as our z, our input. And this is something here, right? So then we know that. Then we know that this, this tail converges. No, I mean not the tail. The sequence, the series, k okay, from zero to infinity converges, which means that the tail. Let me give my argument. Okay, let me just give my argument. I'm talking abstract right now. Right? Which means that for any epsilon greater than zero, we have an n1 such that for any n greater than n1, we have that the tail. Well, you might ask, like, what is what is the meaning of the tail? What is the definition of tail? Like, for those you don't know, it is equal to the tail is equal to. Sorry, this should be yeah, but k was one. It's defined to be this minus, we start from n minus 1, right? So we start from n. That's the definition. Such that this is less than epsilon, right? Because the series converges. Well, to make, because we're stretching all of them right we're controlling all of them so each of them is epsilon over three right so this is what could be less than epsilon okay just doesn't matter but just to look beautiful okay when this is under the assumption that z is in the delta ball of w okay this is under the assumption Okay, also, we have done this part. Now, let's stretch, let's control this part. Control this quote, this part. Well, because observe that the limit of Sn prime is just equal to Zz, Gz, right? This thing would take we take the derivative of a finite sum, right? This drops and the the power also drops, and you take the limit is basically equal to j by direct computation by observation. So, and this is true for any z, right? This is true for any z, and we know that this means that there is n two such that for any n greater than n two. W G of W 
All right, we have stretched this part. Now let's control the last part. Let n equal to max of them so that so that both of these inequality holds. Okay. Now let n be the maximum. We can choose delta such that is delta such that what is it? This pole like this power series, finite power series are always differentiable, okay? I don't have to tell you that. when z minus w is zero or less than delta. Well, after we control all of them, right, which means that we can choose a delta such that whenever this, we have, we have this less than epsilon, right? This less than epsilon with appropriate with appropriate chosen n. Okay. So if that's B. Okay, let's just do part C here. Part C. Oh, part C. It's really easy. Let me say that for n grading with zero. So let's just consider when n is equal to zero. So when n is equal to zero, f zero. Because we assume a is equal to zero, right? Well, like, this should be obvious, okay? Just direct computation. I'll just skip this, okay? It's really easy. Right, so, we're done, aren't we? No, we're not. We still have this lemma. We have to prove this lemma. We use it without proving it. We're never gonna do that in mathematics. Okay, we might do that in physics, but not in mathematics. And not in pure mathematics. We just show this part and we show this part, okay? So first, we know that because b is the limit of bn is greater than zero, which means that this, right, where bn is greater than This is a weaker condition than being in the neighborhood, so of course it should be satisfied. And we take epsilon such that this, then for k greater than n, take this greater than zero. So for k greater than n, first we know that the supremum of should be greater than what? An, right? Now we take, take K T infinity. Right? We take K to infinity, we have N is greater than Now we 
we take when epsilon goes to zero, then we have right. So we've done this part. Second, we want to show this part, right? Now, since we have the supremum a n e n is equal to the supremum of all so a m b n and this should be greater than or equal to the supremum of all with the same index right because this right this contains this set right this has many cases but this is only we were restricting with both have the same index so this is a subset well, because the supremum is monotone, so we have this. And this is really just the the, the, the the property of suprema. I'll just skip it because we have done enough practice of something like this in real uh, single variable analysis, right? So now we take limits. Then we have limit a n, limit b n is greater than or equal to a and b n. Well, this is equal to b, and this is equal to a. Right? So we're done. Okay, we finished the proof of the lemma, and that's the end of the course. Not the end of the course, I'm sorry. The end of second lecture. Okay, well, I will return back soon. See you guys.